So today we'll conclude the class on the foundation of economics. And I'll start by talking about social choice, the field of uh, understanding how to make collective decisions. So how to aggregate individual preferences into collective preferences. Um, this question was first studied by uh, the Marquis de Condorcet right before the French Revolution. And uh, he proposed uh, some voting system, which is one of the best voting system we know so far, uh, the Condorcet method, which uh, is such that when a candidate wins in every duel a majority of the votes against the other candidate, then this candidate is elected. Okay, so let's take an example with the US election. Imagine we would do a separate, uh, like, no, I, I think the best example is the maybe a football game. Like if you take a, a league of, of soccer, uh, each uh, team plays against the other team. And when there is a team that wins all its matches, then it is a champion. Uh, okay, so here um, what uh, we call by winning uh, against the, the team is having a majority of the voter. And Condorcet um, and remarked that there could be uh, what is called the Condorcet paradox, there could be a cycle, meaning that uh, there can be a candidate, L, that uh, is preferred by a majority to M, M is preferred by a majority to N, and N is also preferred to a majority to L. So in this case, there is no Condorcet winner, and uh, we have to resort to another method to find the winner. Uh, and this is why there are several Condorcet methods, um, depending on the variant that, uh, that is chosen. So this paradox shows that, um, imagine you, you, Zurich hesitates between uh, building a hospital or building a stadium. Uh, what uh, the town usually does is a referendum. Okay, so uh, the town decides to, to have a referendum on uh, building the hospital, and this has a majority of yes, and the same day a, a referendum on, having, uh, on building the, the stadium, and this has a majority of no. And then some people protest and ask for a third referendum uh, to choose between a hospital and a stadium. And uh, to the general surprise, then the stadium is preferred to the hospital by a majority. So this can happen. This is due to the Condorcet paradox. And uh, to see why, I will um, show you here the, the profile. So let's say that um, one third of the population ranks, um, so I said that the, the stadium is preferred to uh, the um, hospital by a majority, the hospital is preferred to nothing by a majority, and nothing is preferred to the stadium by a majority. How is this possible? Well, uh, let's say that one third of the, the voter rank uh, first the, um, the hospital, this is their first choice, then second, um, nothing, and third, the stadium. Can you see what I'm writing? Yeah. Then uh, another third, we rotate. Another third prefers, um, I hope, I will not, yeah, prefers nothing then the stadium, then the hospital, and the last third prefers um, the stadium, then the hospital, then nothing. So you see that two-thirds prefer the stadium to the hospital, so there is a majority. Um, two-thirds prefer the hospital to nothing, there is a majority, and two-thirds prefer nothing to the stadium, there is also a majority. So this is a big limitation of uh, democracy. It cannot aggregate uh, preferences in a satisfactory way every time. 
Empirically, we observed that this kind of Condorcet cycle occur in about 10% of cases. So it still works well in 90% of cases. But there are uh, some times where it can occur that uh, we have to elect a winner that uh, is not preferred by a majority to any other candidate. Then in uh, 1951, Kenneth Arrow generalized this result into what's known as the Arrow's impossibility theorem. And uh, it goes the following way. So we call a social ordering a function that takes as input the preferences of each individual, i1 to n, and returns the social preference ordering um, so, yeah, f of these uh, preferences uh, that will be denoted without any index. Uh, we, ha we have some um, criteria that we would like to respect for the social ordering. Uh, the first one is that it's non-dictatorial. What does it mean uh, that a social ordering is dictatorial? Is that it coincides with the preference of one given voter. We also want that it respect the unanimity principle that we've seen last time, that if every voter prefers a L to M, then so should the social, uh, the collective. And we would also like that it respect the independence of irrelevant alternatives. So the basic idea of uh, this IIA uh, assumption is that when you remove one candidate from the list of candidates, it doesn't affect the ordering, the social ordering of the other candidates. So if you remove, for example, a candidate that is not the winner, then the winner, the winner of the election will remain the same. Um, the way it's written mathematically is that uh, if every voter prefers L to M, and uh, we shift the, um, the, the, the ordering uh, in a way that every voter still prefers L to M, then if, uh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. If, uh, it's not every voter prefers L to M. There are some voters that prefer L to M, some voters that prefer M, uh, but we shift orderings in a way that uh, these uh, comparison between L and M are not affected. So the same voters uh, will prefer L and the same voter will prefer M uh, in the case with a prime. Then uh, when we aggregate the preferences, if uh, originally we preferred L, then we would still prefer L with the uh, rearranged, uh, with the, the new, uh, with the, 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 the modification in the orderings. Okay, now the theorem says that when you have at least three candidates, when you have two candidates, everything is going well, you just uh, do a referendum, and uh, yeah, everything works well. But as soon as you have three options, then there doesn't exist a social ordering that is non-dictatorial and fulfills the unanimity principle and uh, independent, independence of irrelevant alternatives. So you have a triangle of impossibility. The, the proof is, uh, is quite uh, complicated, so I, I do not uh, uh, prove it now. So this result um, has been wrongly interpreted as a dismissal of democracy, uh, because uh, the way it is uh, often formulated is uh, a social ordering that fulfills the unanimity principle and the IIA assumption. Uh, the only one that fulfills these two um, uh, desirable criteria is dictatorial. Uh, but this is not how uh, this uh, theorem should be interpreted. Uh, it shouldn't be interpreted as a defense of a dictatorship. What it says instead is that there is no perfect system and uh, that we'll have to, to make so, some compromises. Uh, but probably the, the, the thing that uh, we don't want to compromise is, is the, the most important criterion is probably the non-dictatorial uh, criterion. Um, 
there is actually a way to avoid all this uh, impossibility result. It's to not aggregate ordinal preferences, so not to aggregate rankings, but to aggregate cardinal preferences. So in this uh, type of, of, uh, of system, we don't ask the voters to rank the candidate, but we ask the voters to give a grade to each candidate. It was not studied by Arrow, and uh, for a long time it was not really um, uh, studied or, or yeah, accepted, because um, there is this idea that we cannot really compare uh, what different people think. We, we, I mean, if, if people can, um, can uh, it's, it's clear when, when we say uh, A, I prefer A to B, uh, that uh, I, I mean the same thing as you when you say I prefer A to B, but uh, when you say I grade this candidate 5 over 10, it's not clear that you mean the same thing as me when I say I grade this candidate 5 over 10. And to rely on uh, cardinal um, voting, we need to have a common understanding of the scale. So this is the limitation of the cardinal uh, grading system, is that we, have to, 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 we need to share a common language. But if we share this common language, then we escape the arrow's impossibility result, because this result applies to preferences defined in, in ordinal terms. And the way to aggregate grade, uh, there are different ways, but you can think of the average of the grade, or take the median of the grade, and the candidate with the highest median is the one elected. It's also a good system uh, along the, the Condorcet methods. But even these systems are subject to an even deeper problem that concerns every uh, way of aggregating individual preferences. This uh, was shown by uh, Gibbard and Thaddeus-Thwaite. So it's called the gibbard thaddeus uh, theorem. And it says that any aggregation method suffers from strategic voting, meaning that one's interest is not best served by honesty, but by reacting to others' acts. To take the example of the, the US election, say uh, you, you think uh, Biden has more chances to win than uh, Sanders, but you prefer Sanders. Then your in, but you, and you prefer Biden to Trump. Uh, then your interest is not to uh, vote truthfully, is not to vote honestly for Sanders, but it's to vote for Biden so that he wins the Democratic uh, primaries and then he wins uh, the election. Uh, whereas if you vote for, for Sanders, it's in the, when we imagine that Sanders will lose against Trump and, and Biden will win against Trump. And any uh, voting method is subject to this problem. Is there any question on, the, on this? OK. So um, besides uh, social choice and what we've seen in the previous section, the, the work on general equilibrium, Arrow also revolutionized uh, economics in a number of uh, different ways. He was uh, one of the precursor of endogenous growth theory. He introduced the concept of learning by doing, which explains uh, why we can have uh, increasing returns to scale uh, when an industry is nascent, is new, and uh, which justifies why uh, the government should subsidize new industry, like solar panels, for example, because uh, they will learn uh, quickly and the, the cost will fall um, and he also pioneered what is known as information economics uh, in a brilliant paper that also launched health economics. In this paper, he analyzes in detail how the health system, the medical system works, and how it is not, uh, it, it cannot be understood with the usual tools of economics because it cannot be uh, a competitive uh, sector for a different number of reasons. 
Um, one reason is that there are externalities. For example, when you get vaccinated, it helps not only you, but the others. So if uh, vaccines protect uh, only the, the old people, say, and, uh, but, but there is a small risk of uh, side effects for, for everyone, uh, then it's not in the interest of young people to, to get vaccinated, but it's in the interest of, of uh, the collective welfare. So this is the first reason uh, why we need uh, regulation if we want to maximize social welfare. Another thing is that there are deep problems of information. Because when we go to a doctor, what you want is information. You want to know your diagnosis and you want to know uh, the treatment you need, if you need one. And the thing is that the value of this information depends on what you have. Maybe the doctor will tell you, oh, it's nothing, just, just wait one day and it will pass. And then the value of this advice is close to zero. You could have well stayed at home. Or the doctor will say, oh, well, it's very uh, serious. Uh, it's uh, the beginning of a cancer and we need to treat that immediately. Uh, and then uh, the, the good advice of, of the doctor is extremely valuable to you. And the thing is, you don't want the doctor to maximize their profit because it is not aligned with maximizing your health. If the doctor maximizes their profit, it's in, the interest, in their interest not to cure you uh, rapidly uh, so that you, you come more often to them. Um, so this is why there are institutions that regulate the medical system so that we can trust the doctors and uh, delegate our decision to them, our choices of, of treatment to them because they have more knowledge uh, of what to do with, with our health. And these institutions are created so that uh, the, the, this trust that uh, we put into them, they, they make good use of it and don't uh, exploit the, the power, the knowledge they have uh, to, to make uh, profit um, to the detriment of our health. Uh, one institution in these lines is the licensing, the fact that you need an official authorization to be a doctor, uh, which uh, is delivered if you studied medicine for like 10 years and uh, we know that you know. So uh, we can trust you in a sense as a doctor. Um, the, um, another institution uh, is that uh, the, 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 the healthcare insurance or the, the, the social security, uh, which, which explain why many hospitals are public or there is always a, a public alternative to, to the private uh, sector in most countries. Um, and in the public sector, the doctors uh, ha just uh, earn a wage and uh, it doesn't matter to them uh, whether the, the patients come more often or not. They will not make more profit. It's even more in their interest if the patient doesn't come uh, so often because it makes less work. So um, this is, um, again, an argument in favor of uh, uh, putting the, the medical system out of the market because the, the good it, is, it produces, knowledge, is not uh, really marketable. Uh, in this paper, it also derives the optimal insurance plan uh, which corresponds to the plan we have uh, in Switzerland. So the optimal insurance, when there is no asymmetry of information, we'll deal with asymmetry of information in a few lectures, um, is to have the, the you uh, pay everything until uh, a threshold, a uh, yearly threshold, you pay all your medical expenses, and to have full coverage above, above this deductible. The threshold is the deductible. Um, so he showed that, um, that this is the optimal and that the, the insurance, the price you should pay for your insurance every month is the actual actuarial value. Um, the actuarial value is the expected cost uh, of your medical expenses. 
expected in a sense that there are 99% chance that you will have zero medical expenses and 1% chance that you have an accident and, and you have like 1,000K of, uh, of expenses this year. And so the expected cost will be uh, 1,000. So you should pay 1,000. And uh, the thing is, this is the, the, the value of your insurance. You, you, you prefer to, to, to take this insurance because you are risk averse. You prefer to pay 1,000 uh, every year um, in all the states of the world, rather than to pay 100K in 1% uh, of the state of the world and, and zero in 90% uh, good state of the world. The thing is that there are some, uh, so, so yeah, if there were no administrative costs, the optimal deductible would be zero. So the optimal is that there is full coverage uh, for, for every medical expenses. But because there are administrative costs to run the insurance company, uh, then you prefer to, to pay uh, some medical expense yourself um, to, to avoid the, the, some administrative costs. Uh, he also um, gives an argument in favor of uh, public uh, insurance or mandatory, more, more public, mandatory more than public, mandatory insurance because of the high administrative cost. And so it's costly for the hospital, for the medical system to check whether the patient is insured or not. And if the administrative costs are, are so large, it may be uh, more efficient uh, to just make uh, everyone pay. More efficient for, for social welfare. Okay, are there any questions? So now, um, we enter into the second part of the lecture. So another kind of foundations, the first part were the mathematical foundations of economics, and this part is about the data and uh, the the, the way the data are, are conceptualized. Um, Simon Kuznets, Nobel Prize, uh, was in charge of developing the first system of national accounts for the US during the uh, Great Depression. The US government wanted to know what was going on and uh, for that, it needed to have some measure of the level of activity in the country. So, the main purpose was to measure national production. And there are different uh, synonyms of national production, depending on how we think about it. The totality of uh, what is produced in the economy the output is, is sold, uh, so it is the production. It also corresponds to consumption plus, uh, plus investment, because there are some investment goods. And as it is sold, there are some incomes that are uh, earned either by the workers in the form of wage or to the capital owners in the form of interest, dividends, rent. So national production corresponds to national income. It also corresponds to the gross domestic product, which is also the sum of all value added. So the value added um, is the earnings of um, a company. The value added of a company is its uh, earnings minus its cost in terms of intermediary goods. So if a car manufacturer needs one ton of steel to produce one car, then its value added is to transform the steel into car and will be the difference between the price of the steel and the price of the car. And this value added will remunerate its employees in the form of wage and its capital in the form of interest, dividends. So, uh, all fits together, um, these notions are equal. And there are a different number of ways in which we can uh, measure things. And um, the, the, the way we measure things are defined precisely by accounting rules. 
it's really um, some uh, norms on um, how to categorize things, um, how to uh, interpret things, how to add up things. And there are a variety of uh, different rules that are consistent, and that makes sense. But the, the choice of this rule um, really depends on the purpose of uh, the objective we, 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 we are facing. And so uh, in the, the 30s, the objective was to measure market activity. And the system of national accounts that we still use right now uh, fits well for that purpose to measure market activity. And this is why the, the big indicator that comes out from this uh, system of national accounts is the GDP. So um, this is why we, we use the gross domestic product and not the net domestic product. Um, does someone know what, what would be the net domestic product? So when we say net, it's net of capital depreciation. What is capital depreciation? So um, the, the, the capital we have, uh, the, the buildings, the machines, they need some repair. Uh, sometimes they even need to be replaced uh, because time uh, degrades everything. And um, this generates activity to repair things. But the degradation itself, it's, it's a cost to us. Uh, if you, you don't repair uh, your, your, your bike, let's say, you cannot use your bike anymore. So you should count it negatively. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of the, the inverse of an income. And uh, it materializes in the expenditure to repair your bike. So if you count things in net, you will add the, the value of the repair, which, which doesn't go to you uh, whose bike is broken, but who goes to the, the guy who repaired your bike. He earned something. And you should subtract uh, the, the, the loss of, uh, of the function of your bike which was temporary, but, uh, but in the end, you, you lost the, the, you have an opportunity uh, cost by, by not being able to use this money to a better use. So in net, um, this should be zero, but in gross, this generated some market activity, so it is counted positively. There are a number of ways in which GDP doesn't, doesn't coincide with prosperity. It's just the the measure of activity and marketable, marketed activity. GDP neglects uh, home production. When you cook, for example, or when you take care of your children, it is valuable. And the way to see it's valuable is because uh, when you go to the restaurant, you pay for, uh, for eating, uh, for, for, for the fact that someone cooked uh, instead of you. And this is not counted uh, in GDP, is there a way to, to stop that it goes up and down every time? Oh, okay. Okay, so it, I think it's a good example of things that increases the GDP because it increases energy use but uh, doesn't increase prosperity. <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, home production is not counted into GDP and this is one of the reasons why uh, the US GDP is 25% higher than the GDP of uh, Western, of the European countries like France or Germany. Because American people eat much more often outdoors than uh, they cook. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they trade more with each other for the, the same uh, utility in the end. Um, so, but, but home production is still an activity. There are all, 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 all other things that uh, matter for prosperity um, that are not related to uh, activity or that are inversely related to activity. Activity generates pollution and this uh, is bad for uh, welfare. 
is not counted in GDP. Then uh, the level of health is not uh, counted, but it's very important for uh, our welfare. The depletion of resources, what we call natural capital, uh, is basically the same idea of, uh, as the building, the, that, or the bike that needs to be repaired. For uh, everything we build, we need some resources, metals, oil, uh, coal, etc. And um, if these resources are finite, non-renewable, then we, de we, we, we build uh, some, some, some buildings, some machines, by decreasing the level of natural capital, by decreasing the amount of metals that we have available in the ground. If this view is the correct view, which is uh, debatable, but um, then um, building a new machine doesn't add up to, uh, to the prosperity of uh, humankind. Maybe it helps for the current generation, but to the detriment of future generation, we will not be able to use this resource. So this doesn't appear in the GDP because uh, in the system of national accounts, the natural capitals is not taken into account. We take into account all that is artificial. So there is a list of all assets in terms of, of buildings, machines, etc. But there isn't a list of assets in terms of resources, natural resources. Um, these resources also include biodiversity, uh, ecological uh, um, ec uh, ecosystem services, uh, the pollution negatively, uh, etc. Um, the, the system of national accounts also doesn't account for inequalities. Although for a given level of GDP, uh, it's arguably better to be in an equal than an unequal society. Um, then came ecological economists who wanted to improve on, uh, on all this and conceive the production system or our economy within the ecological system. So the economy is conceived as a subsystem uh, of a, a broader uh, system that also includes uh, social uh, relationships, so institutions, and uh, the, the physical world, the physical constraints, and the flows and stocks of, uh, of energy and materials. And um, uh, this new sign denotes uh, the Leontief Prize, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll talk a bit about some uh, Leontief Rice winners, uh, especially um, when uh, I'll do the lecture on development, because uh, there are not so many uh, Nobel Prizes uh, in development, but uh, many Leontief Prize. So um, Leontief Prize uh, is awarded to economists that, um, that, that uh, address a uh, question of uh, social and uh, uh, ecological uh, relevance. Uh, and, and many of them are heterodox economics, economists uh, that, that do not uh, fall into the, the lines of thinking of neoclassical uh, economics. So Herman Daly is one of the founders of ecological economics and uh, he developed a genuine progress indicator to improve upon GDP, to measure something else, that market activity, to measure something closer to prosperity. And uh, in so doing, it counts, it differentiates three kinds of, of things, goods, bads, and anti-bads. So it's, it's uh, interesting um, etymologically that we talk of good for any product or service, even though it's not necessarily good. Um, and, um, but, in goods, uh, Aman Dali uh, puts uh, almost all GDP as well as home production. Then bads are essentially pollution. So, uh, so you subtract the, the, the cost to society 
uh, of um, avoiding pollution, the, of, of medical expenses to cure diseases caused by pollution, uh, etc. All the, um, the social cost, the external cost of, of pollution. And then you have the type of goods that um, are antibodies that, that exist just to counteract the negative effect of uh, something that is happening. And uh, this includes military spending, um, police, uh, so defense expenditures that are there to, or surveillance ex expenditure that are there to provide, uh, to, to prevent, sorry, um, a loss uh, of, uh, yeah, to prevent crimes. Um, Antibads also include the, the can, can also include the, uh, the, the cost of uh, reforestation or anything to contract uh, something that is bad. So there, there is a, actually, tw it's, it's the, um, this genuine progress indicator uh, includes many different things, like 20 things, different things. So I cannot list them all. And, uh, yes? I'm not necessarily like sure why he puts the negative sign to it. I mean, for, for example, let's say now we do much more reforestation uh, in the next 10 years. Then I would say like our sort of progress goes up, but with yeah. this logic it would still decrease. Okay, maybe uh, reforestation, maybe I, I said a uh, mistake. Maybe it's not an anti-bad reforestation. But maybe also with uh, police, I mean... So police, so police it counts I think it will count positively in the GDP and negatively oh, okay. and negatively in the in the anti bad. So it should then be sort of neutral more than it's it's neutral. It's like uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like if we could achieve the same society without crime and without police, we'll be equally happy. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, some researchers have uh, computed this uh, genuine progress indicator uh, and uh, found that uh, at the global level, although uh, the global GDP, the global average income has been rising uh, constantly since, uh, this, this goes back to the 50s, but um, since the 70s, the progress has stalled, at least globally. Um, mainly due to uh, the increase in, in pollution, global warming, etc., that, that counteracted uh, the, the, the growth in activity. Um, yeah, and you can imagine how uh, these accounting rules, like in the genuine progress indicator, uh, you can understand it even more easily than in the GDP, it's subject to a number of hypotheses. Like, uh, what is the cost of one ton of CO2? What is the... So the, there are a number of, uh, of assumptions and also behind GDP uh, calculations uh, that make this, uh, this indicator uh, always um, imprecise and, and subject to, to criticisms. Um, now, uh, Kuznets uh, welcomed the endeavor of this uh, ecological economics, economist because uh, he was uh, also critical of, uh, of the, the, the lack of, of the, the limitation of, of the system of national account. And he made some other contributions to economics. He, because uh, he not only uh, invented the, the, the accounting rules, but he also collected the data and produced the, the first set of, of uh, series of, um, of uh, national accounts. He observed then that a large part of growth was not due to capital accumulation, to savings, and thus attributed this growth to uh, knowledge and technology. And uh, that's, that works for the rich country, but in the low-income countries, uh, there wasn't, there didn't have uh, such a, there hasn't been uh, such a high growth, uh, despite uh, knowledge being in theory uh, accessible to, to everyone. And so he attributes the missing growth in these other countries by deficient institution. 
uh, which, for example, uh, do not um, um, sustain the trust, the trust between members of society that is needed uh, for them to engage in, in, uh, in activities. Um, he also make, uh, made a, yeah, th these results are debated, but, uh, but, um, but he, he made his observation at least. And, and he also made a conjecture, which is known as the Kuznets curve, that about the level of inequality when a country grows. Because he observed, he observed that uh, as the US and other countries uh, have grown in the 19th and uh, 20th century, the level of inequality has risen and then decreased. And so he conjectured that uh, this would be the case for every country. Yeah. Um, Another Nobel Prize was awarded uh, for uh, improving uh, national accounting, Richard Stone, who uh, introduced double entry accounting. So, double entry, so uh, the, 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 without double entry accounting, you just sum list of things that add up. And with double entry accounting, you, you sum, uh, when you sum something, you also sum some other thing, some other corresponding thing on a separate column. And the two things, the two totals should match. For example, you can have incomes and expenditures or assets and liabilities. And uh, it's useful because uh, if you find discrepancies between the two totals, it indicates errors. It helps, it helps checking there, there is no errors. What about um, what's happening now? Uh, oh, there are still some research uh, going on, some improvement in this field? Yes. Uh, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Sez, and uh, Gabriel Zuckman and others um, are developing uh, what they call the distributional national accounts where here the goal is uh, not only to measure market activity, but the level of inequality. So they distribute national income into the different percentiles, and, uh, and so show not only the aggregate uh, national income, but uh, the, the national income for the bottom 50%, the, the top 10%, the top 1%, etc. etc. And uh, they have produced uh, the data. It's quite recent that we have good data uh, on, on the, the series on inequalities. Uh, and and uh, Thomas Piketty was a pioneer and, um, and uh, gathered, collected data back to the, the 19th century. And, uh, and now they're, they're still adding more country, more, more things. It's very active. Um, Gabriel Zuckman. Um, student, student of Piketty, which, who is now at Berkeley, um, used anomalies in national accounts, so these discrepancies uh, in double entry accounting, these errors, he, he interpreted them uh, in some, some way with Swiss data, actually, uh, as uh, the, the hidden wealth. And this is how we now have a good estimates of the wealth that is hidden in tax havens. And uh, Zuckman, together with uh, this group of people, and uh, Tay and uh, Nougared, uh, propose uh, an important policy, which is a global financial register. register. This would uh, note, uh, re yeah, record uh, all the assets that uh, exist and uh, who own them. This exists to some extent uh, for the buildings in every country. Uh, this is a cadaster, but they want to extend it to have something that uh, is, is um, global in the sense that the information uh, can, can be uh, shared between uh, national authorities and that not only concern buildings and land, but also concerns financial assets. This will allow to have much more precise data on uh, inequalities, 
but it will also uh, allow to tax uh, entities, firms and people that for the moment uh, escape taxation because we don't know what they own. Okay. Uh, there is a new question. Yeah. Uh, regarding the, this uh, loss uh, idea of the global financial register, did they propose like specific measures how to, to do that? Because uh, it seems like yeah. it's pretty challenging for me. So the, uh, okay, so the, the question is, wh how did they propose? So in this paper, Ten Nugared, they propose, uh, these are uh, legal scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, f uh, so, so yeah, they, they propose something. Um, so yeah, there is a research going on both on the technical parts, like uh, how should we uh, specify the technical requirements? Uh, uh, some propose to use the blockchain, maybe it's not, use, maybe it's not the necessary. And there is some uh, search in the legal parts as well. Uh, but the, the problem is political, of course. Uh, it's not uh, technical. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this, this could potentially be a game changer because with that we could, for example, imagine a maximum wealth, uh, global maximum wealth, or something like that. Um, authorized. Okay. Um, so Leontiev, who gave his name to the Leontiev Prize, uh, introduced a, a, a clever way, maybe the engineering way, to think about uh, economics, to think about the production system. This is called input-output analysis. And uh, a precursor was uh, uh, Kenney in the Tableau Economique. Uh, He's a, known as a physiocrat, uh, one of the first economists. Uh, he didn't make it to posterity, to posterity because he made a mistake. He thought that uh, all the, 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 the value uh, came from land uh, because France was an agricultural uh, country and he didn't understand that it came from labor instead. Anyway, uh, the, oh no. Um, What's going on? Uh, who among you uh, know about matrices and uh, linear algebra? Okay, and who doesn't? Who, who has no clue about that? Okay, half, half. So, so in, maybe for those who don't, these slides will not be uh, perfectly understandable, and the next one, uh, neither. Um, yes. So, um, the idea of, uh, of Leontiev, and of input-output analysis, cool is to represent uh, the production system as a matrix. So a matrix is just um, a table, like a grid uh, with numbers. Oh. Does this uh, happen uh, sometimes? Uh, I don't know what to do says that in th 35 seconds it will uh, have started, but uh, not sure. Okay. All right. So, um, yes, yeah, so matrix is a, is a table of, of numbers. And um, the main matrix in input, uh, input analysis is the technology matrix. 
So uh, capital A. It's a square matrix where um, on the line AI and the colon J, you have the coefficient AIJ, which gives the number of units of product I needed to, produ to produce one unit of product J. So if you want, it's like a list of recipes. So you can have uh, like different uh, ingredients that are correspond to the different uh, products in society. So you can think of uh, beef, flour, salad, uh, etc. And, uh, and also the, the basic product, but you also have uh, like more complicated product like uh, pizza. And, uh, and so I, uh, AJ, will tell you uh, if I is uh, tomatoes and J is pizza, it will tell you how many tomato you need to produce one pizza. And uh, so this represents the technology available to society. And now, take the vector of final demand denoted Y. So this is all what we consume in a given year. Okay, so uh, thousand pizza, one car, uh, one computer, etc. And uh, X is the gross output, so all that is needed to produce Y. Y and the intermediate goods. So uh, if I, I consume like uh, one car, I will also need uh, uh, steel and uh, the machines to, to handle this steel, etc. And uh, now production can be found by, multi by, by, met by, uh, by algebraic uh, computation. So uh, what we need to produce to, to, to have the final consumption uh, vector is equal to this um, final consumption y plus what is needed to produce it, a times y, plus what is needed to produce what is needed to produce it, a squared times i, etc. recursively. So for the car, you need the car, you need um, the machines to build the car, you need the machines to build the machines to build the car, you need the machines to the machines to produce the machines to build the car. And um, you can uh, put Y in, uh, in uh, you say, uh, like together, <laughs> lose the, the word. And, uh, and then you add up one plus A plus A squared plus S to the power three, etc. Uh, this is the inverse of the identity matrix minus A. And uh, you get that uh, the total production you need is this inverse matrix times the, the final uh, demand. This view of, uh, so this, this helps, for example, for planning. If you, if you wonder uh, what you need uh, to, to produce uh, certain, um, certain things, uh, and it's no surprise that Leontiev uh, was a Russian, even though he immigrated and, and worked uh, in Harvard most of his life. Um, the idea behind it is uh, to compute uh, what we, we need, what uh, machines, what, what plants we need uh, to uh, offer the, the demand we desire. This view corresponds to a Leontiev production function. And Leontiev production function, um, contrary to Cobb Douglas production function, there is no possible substitution between factors of production. This is really rigid recipe. When you want to produce something, so here you want to produce good J, and you have uh, some uh, input, some ingredients. So say you want to produce a pizza and you have like uh, uh, two uh, can of tomato sauce, uh, one um, pizza uh, dough, and uh, some uh, anchovies, then you can only produce one pizza because you have only uh, one dough, even though you have uh, two cans of, of tomatoes. So there is no uh, substitution between factors, it's just the minimum of the, the ingredients, the, the inputs you have times their coefficient. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an accurate way to present things to a sexual extent, but to a sexual extent it's not, because uh, to some degree there is always some substitution between factors. For example, the dough, you can make your pizza thinner and then produce 1.5 pizza with the, the given dough. 
Um, you can also uh, use a new technology if uh, you lack of a resource, to use less of this resource and more of another instead. Uh, another issue is that it's a static model. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, model innovation. And a practical issue is that when we try to represent the economy with such matrices, we face problem of data quality because we don't have uh, good data on, uh, on these things. But still, research is, uh, is active on this topic, and uh, now the model has been extended to make it dynamic, to handle substitution to some extent, etc. Uh, the input analysis is used uh, in many parts of economics, for example, in trade economics, where we take a generalization of this uh, technology matrix. It's a multi-regional input-output table. So here, you not only record what kind of input is used for a given, uh, what kind of product uh, is, kind of, is used for to produce one kind, uh, other kind of product, but what kind of product of which country is used by, to produce one kind of product of another country. So it makes huge uh, matrices that capture the, the trades that are up, uh, occurring in, uh, between sectors in different countries. Um, this is used in macroeconomic modeling in what we call computable general equilibrium model that are a modern version of uh, the Keynesian models introduced by Lawrence Klein and uh, who disaggregate, they, they disaggregate the economy into different sectors. It's used in life cycle analysis and life cycle analysis is the method uh, with which we compute things like the carbon footprint of a product. How do we do that? We introduce um, another matrix that is called the characterization matrix and whose coefficient Cij is the requirement uh, of I, so for example the carbon emission, uh, from producing one unit of J, like for example one car. But it can handle many things, not only carbon emission, also the number of hours worked, uh, the, the, the extraction of uh, copper needed, many different things, pollution that it entails. And then to compute the carbon footprint of one car, you take as the final uh, demand, good, de demand vector, the vector that uh, only contains one car. You compute the, the, product, the production needed to produce this car, which is not only the car, but also the machines, etc. And uh, you multiply it by the characterization matrix, and it gives you uh, all the, the characterization of this car in terms of, car, of footprint, in terms of carbon footprint, number of hours of work needed, in terms of iron extracted, etc. Okay, maybe before the pause, I'm finishing this uh, lecture with linear programming. So uh, nowadays it's taught uh, in computer science programs, but uh, Nobel Prizes were awarded uh, for the development of linear programming. Uh, this uh, method is used to solve broad uh, class of problems. It's really uh, vastly used. And to give just one example, I'll give an example uh, that uh, a Nobel Prize uh, has worked on, Stiegler. To feed the army during the Second World War, he tried to compute the diet that uh, fits, that meets some nutritional requirements, uh, the, the, like the, the recommended uh, nutritional requirements, at the least cost. So this is the, so if you, you have uh, as a data, the price vector, the price of each type of food, and the nutritive content of each type of food, in terms of different nutritions, so vitamin A, vitamin B, protein, uh, calories, then you can solve this problem through linear programming. The minimum uh, cost of the diet Y under the constraint that the nutritional requirements N times I are above the requirements. And, uh, and here I think we don't need the non-negative uh, inequality constraint because of course uh, you will not have uh, negative uh, nutritional requirements. 
And um, yeah, there is an equivalent dual problem, uh, but I won't go into the detail. Uh, the, just saying that uh, there is a, a problem whose solution is equivalent to this minimization program, which is a maximization program in terms of maximizing the shadow value of the nutritional contents. Um, yeah, so some uh, early mathematician uh, studied the problem, but uh, the algorithm they proposed were uh, way too slow. And it's uh, Leonid Kantorovich uh, who found an efficient method when, uh, so the Russian mathematician uh, whose task uh, in the 30s was to um, tell the, 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 USS, the Soviet government uh, what was the least cost method to transport wood from uh, different woods to different factories. And uh, he came up with uh, this method. Uh, this is very related to the Hitchcock uh, uh, transportation problem, which is basically what I've just described. You have uh, different uh, routes that you can take to, to bring uh, some materials from uh, different places to, uh, that are sources to other different places that are sinks, and you find the, the routes that uh, bring the, the materials with the, the least number of kilometers. And, uh, but it's uh, an American dancing, Dancic who invented the, the simplex algorithm, which is the, the most popular solution nowadays. Uh, for those who are uh, mathematically uh, inclined, uh, this is a representation of the problem. So this kind of ball is a polytop. Each face of, uh, of the polytop uh, represents a constraint. So it's, um, if you prolong it, it's like a plane. And uh, the, the constraints say that you should be on one side of the plane. And there are several constraints. When you take these constraints jointly, you should be within this polytop. And uh, you maximize a li linear function uh, on, the, on the, 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 the Euclidean space uh, within this polytop. Uh, we can show that the maximum uh, is necessarily on an edge and uh, the simplex algorithm, it starts with a random edge and then uh, moves along the edge until uh, it finds the, the maximum. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's weird that Dunsink uh, didn't uh, get the Nobel Prize for this, uh, although Koopmans uh, got it. Uh, Koopmans uh, was also active in this field. He edited the first book on linear programming. And uh, yeah, so the, the simplex algorithm, uh, again, is for people who like uh, computer science. Uh, it has a polynomial complexity, so it's quite uh, fast. Uh, polynomial complexity for random cases, but an exponential complexity, so very slow uh, for the worst cases. So there are other methods that work well in worst cases. There are entire points method, and they are being refined, uh, I mean, uh, continuously. Um, and this has countless applications. Uh, how you should uh, plan your uh, electricity uh, sector, like uh, what plants, uh, what type of uh, nuclear, wind panels, uh, solar panels should you build. Uh, routing, the, the transportation system I just uh, mentioned, like you're a bu uh, bus company and you need to, to choose the, um, the destination you propose. Uh, scheduling uh, for, to, to devise uh, your agenda as a student. Uh, assignment. To, to, if you're uh, a company to, uh, or uh, yeah, to find the, the best assignment to workers, from workers to task, given their, their skills. So yeah, this is very useful. Thank you, and yeah, a little pause between the game theory. So let's start uh, with game theory. It will be a lecture that will be half funny and half uh, demanding in terms of... Uh, <laughs> um, so game theory is the study of uh, situations of conflict and cooperation. So it's not only about uh, games as we know it colloquially, but it's really about many types of human interactions or non-human. Um, there is a, a result that uh, I want to give you because it's, it really surprised me when I first learned about it. 
in a class of the game theory. Um, it was uh, proven by uh, Zermelo, which uh, besides that was a very important mathematician. Uh, he showed that there is a, a winning strategy in chess. So a winning strategy is, so first, what is a strategy? A strategy is a plan on how you should play. So uh, does everyone know the rules of chess? Yes? Okay, good, because uh, we'll talk about chess. But um, yeah, so a strategy is a plan on how you will uh, play. So, so you can think, but can we really talk about strategy in chess because no one really has a plan of how they will play because a plan is really a comprehensive plan. The plan says what you, sh what you should do with your first move, what we should do with the second move, conditional on one the the other uh, the opponent r replied what should you do in any situation uh, what should be your move uh, so y you see that uh, it involves a lot of uh, possibilities a lot of things to take into account to devise a strategy in chess and a winning strategy is a strategy that uh, maximizes your, uh, that minimizes your maximal loss. Maximal loss, it means that uh, your opponent is uh, even better than uh, Magnus Carlsen. Uh, it's like the, 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 they make the best move at every move. So at this stage, we don't know yet whether there is a best move, but actually this is what we're gonna prove, that there is a best move to at each, uh, at each uh, in each situation. And so against such, a, the, 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 such an opponent, the perfect opponent, uh, the winning strategy makes you win if you can win, uh, makes you uh, lose if you have no other choice, and uh, gives draw, uh, draw is equality, uh, if, uh, if it's the best thing that can happen. Um, so actually, we know that there is a winning strategy in chess, I will prove it to you, but we don't know what the strategy is, and we don't even know, and so there is a winning strategy for white, there is a winning strategy for black, but we don't even know whether uh, the winning strategies, see if both play the winning strategy, uh, if white will win, white, uh, black will win, or if it will be a draw. So, uh, so we don't know, but, um, but if both players are perfect, the result will always be the same. Maybe a draw, maybe a white win, we don't know. Um, how does this work? Okay, let's start. We need to start by the, the very end of the game. So here I take a hypothetical situation uh, where uh, white um, moves and white has only two possible moves. Uh, the upper move uh, moves uh, the, the queen and uh, is checkmate. And uh, the lower move uh, is the, the only other possibility. Uh, white moves the, their queen to the wrong position and there is a stalemate. The situation where black uh, is not uh, checked, but black cannot move, and uh, so it's a draw. So if uh, white uh, is a perfect player and, uh, and faces this situation, then uh, black... <laughs> then uh, white uh, would play the upper move and win. Now, let's take uh, a step back and think the previous move. Imagine that in this previous move, black has two choices. Either uh, the first choice is gives it, uh, leads it to the situation uh, that I just described, and the second move, uh, black wins. Uh, black can, uh, can make a checkmate. So if black is a perfect player, of course, he will choose the checkmate. So white, in the move uh, before, uh, shouldn't go in the upper move in the situation where black will win. Black should choose the other possible move and uh, arrive in the below part of the diagram and then uh, black, it's black's turn, and uh, whatever black uh, chooses, white will win, because white has a checkmate option in both cases. 
So, um, in the, um, you see that at the last move, uh, it's straightforward for, for white to decide what to play. Um, in the, the move before, it's uh, also simple for black to decide. Even if the, the below part, uh, black is indifferent between the two options. And uh, in the, the, the third move uh, before the end, uh, as white is intelligent, uh, white knows that the upper part uh, reduces to losing and the below part to winning. So white will choose the, the winning uh, strategy. And so you see that I have reduced the, the tree uh, of, uh, of the, the, the possible games uh, by uh, replacing the, what will happen if both play correctly. Uh, so I, I, I move two steps uh, backward and I replace uh, the, the, the upper part by just uh, losing uh, for white and the below part by just winning uh, for, for white. So um, in theory, you can do this for every possible end of the game. And actually, there is only one tree in chess. The, the first, the, um, how you say, the, the, the root of the tree is the, the first move of white, because white starts to play. And uh, you have many moves. You have uh, not two possible moves, maybe uh, 20, I don't know. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah. And, uh, and then it grows exponentially. But it always ends, because the game of chess always ends. So it's a finite tree. It's a very big tree, but it's a finite tree. And you can reason by backward induction this way and reduce the tree to uh, the first move that will tell uh, white which moves are uh, green, which moves are uh, red, and which moves are, are yellow. So when I say there is a winning strategy, maybe there are several winning strategies. But uh, we are sure that uh, there is, um, if, if there is a, a green uh, dot in the first move of of, uh, of white, then uh, white is sure to get to win uh, if uh, by taking this path. Uh, maybe there are several green uh, possibilities. Maybe there is no green. There is uh, the best thing uh, black ca white can do is a, is a draw. It's yellow. But there is a winning strategy, and um, it's too computation computationally demanding. Uh, to, to compute it uh, because there is a 10 to the power uh, 120 uh, different uh, path, different uh, uh, situation, a different uh, end of game in chess, and different uh, moves, different parties, sorry, yeah, different possible parties. And, uh, and there is uh, only 10 to the power, I think, uh, 30 or 50 uh, atoms in the universe. So, so it's far from achievable to, to, to compute the winning strategy. Um, what launched uh, game theory is uh, um, an, an article by uh, von Neumann, Zur Theorie der Gesellschaftsspiele. It was the time where uh, researchers uh, continued to, to write in their own language. Actually, it was Hungarian, but, uh, but German was, uh, was really spread out. Um, in this part of Europe. And um, he proved the Minimax theorem. I'll tell you at the end of the slide what it is. And uh, Morgenstern uh, helped uh, join forces. And together, they wrote a seminal book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. I've already talked about it in the previous lecture, because it's in this book that they showed the expected utility uh, uh, representation. And in this book, they systematize the study of games. They really um, give the, the, the big uh, definitions, the, the setting that is uh, still used today. And they extend the, minimum, uh, the Minimax theorem. Um, yeah, just a few words on uh, von Neumann. Uh, this guy was really uh, a genius. Like, uh, it's impressive when, uh, when you check on Wikipedia all the, the achievements uh, he did. Uh, he, he died uh, early, like uh, in, the, in his 50s, because of um, in, when, when he helped uh, build the atomic bomb uh, during the World War, uh, he got uh, some uh, radi radioactive radiation. 
and uh, he, he really uh, contributed uh, enormously to mathematics and uh, and also physics and uh, and as a side uh, uh, hobby uh, he also revolutionized uh, economics um, there are many funny anecdotes uh, with him for example uh, at uh, six year old uh, as he could um, divide uh, two eight uh, digit numbers uh, by head uh, he was uh, seeing his mother uh, staring uh, endlessly and he asked her uh, uh, mother what are you computing so yeah this type of, of guy um, he, he, he died too early to, to get the Nobel Prize or any big prize, but uh, okay, he, he defined what is a game and what are the different types of games. So a game, we consider a finite number of players and each player chooses a strategy that maximizes their expected payoffs. So uh, the available strategy is the big S and player I will choose the strategy SI that maximizes the, um, the expected payoff. The payoff is UI, and it depends on what I plays and what the other plays. So, so SI, uh, S minus I is a shortcut to write uh, S1, S2, uh, until SN, except SI. Why is there an expectation? Because there can be some random uh, moves from nature. Nature can be considered as a, as a particular player. Uh, it can also be expected because uh, the player has some beliefs regarding what the others will play, but, uh, but this was not in uh, von neumann Wagenstein's it's a later addition to the theory. So the payoff, it will depend on the games of the rule. It's, the game of the rule is, is uh, most of all the payoff uh, function, functions. Um, it depends on the action of all players and of, on random realization of natures. And uh, in turn, what... Okay, so this is a strategy. I've defined a strategy. Then we have also what we call action. Action, it's... A, it's like a, a move in chess is an action. So a strategy will be the, the plan of, uh, of all actions depending on uh, what the others have done. And, um, and you can also use mixed strategies. So imagine a, a game that is not um, sequential like the, the chess or where you have several moves, but you have only one move. Uh, for example, um, rock, uh, paper, scissors. Uh, so in, uh, in rock, paper, scissors, you have three actions, uh, which coincides with the three pure strategies. And we have what we call mixed strategies. Mixed strategies, it's uh, you flip a coin in your head, and, uh, or you flip a dice, let's say, in your head, and uh, if, uh, if it's one or two, you play uh, rock. If it's uh, three or four, you, pay, you play uh, paper. If it's five or six, you play scissors. That's the best strategy in rock, paper, scissors. Uh, and it's a mixed strategy because you randomize. Each player uh, randomizes the possible action they will do. Uh, okay, so the action of a player stem from their strategy. Um, so in case it's a mixed strategy, uh, you f the action in the end will depend on, uh, on the, the random draw you made. Uh, and it also depends on the information available to the player. If I know that uh, you will play uh, scissors, I will play rock. Okay. Now there are different types of games. There are games of complete information. Uh, in the country, the, the, when it's not complete, it's incomplete information, is the, the games where players know the strategies and the payoffs available uh, to all. So uh, do you have um, examples of uh, games of complete information? Is, is chess a game of complete information? Mm. 
What did you say? Yes, yes. Because uh, you know the payoffs, or you, maybe it's, yeah, we, we, you know that, I mean, in, we imagine that the payoff is like uh, one, uh, if, I, if, I, one if I win, uh, zero if I lose, and one half if it's a draw for me, and the same for, for the opponent. So we know the payoff, and we know the strategies available, uh, because we know all the, the, all the, the, what the player can do. Um, is a rock, paper, scissors a game of complete information? Yes, the same. Um, now, do you have an example of a game of incomplete information? So it's, it's much harder to think, and actually you should think uh, outside what we understand commonly as games. But uh, we can imagine that uh, diplomatic relationships like uh, war, uh, peace, etc., is a game of incomplete information. You don't know uh, whether your opponent, what, what weapons they have. So you don't know uh, what strategies are available to them. You don't know necessarily their payoff. You don't know uh, what, uh, what will uh, happen to them if, uh, if, uh, if they, yeah. So you don't know what they have in mind. Um, do you have uh, other examples? Insurance. Um, so, why is it a game of uh, incomplete information? Insurance. Because you don't know what the possible outcomes are. That's why you, you get it. Um, yes. So, yeah, the fundamental reason is because the insurance company doesn't know uh, the the type of the, the buyer, what we call by type is whether this person is high risk or low risk. And uh, this, uh, the fact that this person takes many risks or, or, or has many medical risks or not, uh, will impact the payoff uh, function of the insurance company, possibly also the payoff of the, the buyer itself. So yes, it's a game of incomplete information. Now we have perfect uh, game of perfect information. So it's uh, yeah, it's 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 hard not to confuse complete and perfect, but it's not the same. So perfect information, player know the previous moves of everyone, including nature. Um, I put previous in parentheses because. Uh, in games that are uh, simultaneous, like rock, paper, scissors, uh, it's imperfect information because you don't know the current move uh, of, of, of the other. Because, you know. But in general, we, we think about it like not knowing what has happened before. So can you, uh, sorry, this is imperfect information. Perfect is when you know what happened before. So can you um, give an example of a game with perfect information? Chess, yes. And of a game with imperfect information? What? Penalty. Penalty, uh, it's a very good example because uh, it's a game with uh, complete information. Okay, there are, uh, you said penalty in football, right? Yeah. It's a game with complete information. You have uh, basically uh, three possible uh, moves for the, the goal and goalkeeper and for the, 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 I don't know how to say, the player. It's like uh, plunging on the left, plunging on the right, or staying, or like shooting on the left, on the right. And um, it happens simultaneously. So yeah, and you also know the payoff, okay? Uh, it's, it's clear uh, who will win or not. Um, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's imperfect information because you don't know what the other uh, will do. 
So it's, um, actually I think the next one is simultaneous games versus sequential games. And uh, simultaneous games where all players play at the same time, it's always imperfect information. Uh, do you have uh, an example of a game of imperfect information that is sequential? What about poker? Is it perfect or imperfect information? I imperfect, yes. Because you, you, you've seen what the other players have, have bet, but what you don't know is what nature has done. You don't know what hand they have. So you don't know, the, the players don't know the, the moves of everyone because they don't know the, the random draw of nature. Uh, and is it of complete information, poker? Imagine, okay, imagine poker where uh, it's like a, a, a tournament where every player puts uh, 10, 10 euros at the beginning and they cannot put more money uh, afterwards. Then yes, it's complete information because you know the payoff, you know the strategies. I mean, Kirby and Gyu argued that you don't necessarily know the payoff because, because some people are more risk averse than other. No, 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 you know the payoff for sure because, uh, because it's either you win everything or you lose, uh, or you lose everything. So it's one zero, yeah. Okay, then there is a type of game, uh, a of game I will not talk uh, in this lecture unless you really want to, is cooperative games. So uh, all what we'll talk about are non-cooperative games. And in cooperative games, players can form coalitions where they commit to follow a certain strategy. So um, another characterization of uh, cooperative games is that the outcome of the game will always be Pareto optimal. So it's, it's really um, another, uh, yeah, it it's also comes with another way of thinking about games, uh, cooperative uh, game theory. And uh, to give you an example of the problems that are addressed by co cooperative game theory, it's like um, when uh, two, two countries or two cities, let's say Zurich and Milan, uh, wants to, to build a railroad between uh, the two, to join the two, because it's uh, mutually beneficial to them to build the railroad. Uh, this is why it's a cooperative game, because uh, both players uh, have an interest to cooperate and to form a coalition with the other uh, by building the railroad together, rather than to, to not cooperate and nothing gets built and uh, with a notion that uh, is called the Chaplet value, uh, cooperative game theory explains how the benefits from the railroad, how the cost of building the railroad should be split between Zurich and Milan by computing the, the value uh, occurring to, to Zurich and Milan uh, by building the, the railroad. Um, yeah, and, and here the um, the key the key difference between with uh, non-cooperative games is the the fact that uh, players can commit to follow the strategy, because um, contracts are enforceable. So so if uh, Zurich and uh, and Milan um, start, uh, I mean. Imagine that, uh, that they were not enforceable. So, um, so they say, okay, I, we build the, 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 the railroad, we split half-half, then uh, the Italian starts uh, building the, the railroad, they, they build their, their half, and uh, the Swiss do nothing. And, uh, and they do nothing, why? Because uh, when the Italians realize that uh, the Swiss have done nothing, then uh, the Italian computes uh, the, the things and they, 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 it turns out that uh, it's beneficial to them 
to complete the railroad uh, um, just um, on themselves, so they pay the entire cost of it. Uh, they, will, they will make more money like that than uh, to, to abandon, the, to give up the project. So uh, if this could be the case, uh, then each uh, side would fear that the, the other side uh, doesn't do their part. Uh, this is uh, the public good problem where uh, each benefits from the contribution uh, to all, but uh, as an interest to free ride, not to do their, their, their part because they know that the, the other players uh, will compensate. So if uh, this was pos uh, possible, uh, the, the equilibrium can be that uh, neither of them uh, would uh, build uh, the railroad for fearing that the, others, uh, the other doesn't cooperate. But contracts are enforceable and uh, there is a rule of law and uh, we know that, uh, that the judiciary system can make sure that uh, if they have agreed to pay, they will pay. Okay. Now, what is the Minimax theorem? And I will conclude with this. It says that uh, in the simplest uh, kind of non-cooperative gains, which are simultaneous, synchronous is a synonym, with two players and zero sum. This zero sum, it's like uh, chess or rock, paper, scissors. It means that um, the, the aggregate uh, payoff, when you add up the payoff of, uh, of all players, it always sums to zero, or always sums to a constant. So, uh, so a typical example is one either uh, win or loses, and vice versa for the other. So in a two-player zero-sum game with complete information, I think, yeah, there is a, a pair of optimal strategies for both players in the sense that the strategies allow each player to minimize their maximum losses. So in a sense, it's a generalization of the, the result uh, of the AMLO, uh, to, uh, to all uh, two-player zero-sum games, and it will extend it to n players uh, by von Neumann and Morgenstern. So there is, it's saying that there is a, yeah, there is a best uh, strategy, and in equilibrium, rational player will play it. Uh, and tomorrow we'll see a, a more interesting notion uh, next week of equilibrium. Thank you.